Good morning, Benjamin Hadfield. Teach me to dive. I'm a technical dive instructor teaching Florida. We teach in Idaho as well. And we're really privileged and honored to have Laura Maroney. Uh, Laura, if you don't know her, she's the vice president of Dan Europe. Yes, Dan.org in Europe, as well as the CEO of Dan Europe Group, which we're definitely going to get into figure out. Um, that is an amazing title and sounds very cool as well. Now, Laura is an accomplished diver. She's an accomplished professional as well in many areas, and we're very honored to have her. Laura, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for inviting me, Benjamin. I'm really I'm excited to be excited. here with you. Right on. Well, let's just jump into the meat and potatoes. Laura, what initially sparked your interest in diving, and how did you evolve into this prof professional pursuit of uh, Queen of Dan? <laughs> well, um, I think diving was always part of me. Uh, it comes somehow from my family because my, my father uh, has been the first diving medicine physician in Italy. Uh, I, I'm from Italy, by the way. Um, and uh, I started to dive with him when I was very, very young, uh, at the age of six. <laughs> but then I got my first certification at the age of uh, eight. Uh, and uh, and that's a journey that never stopped. So I knew since when I was a kid that um, I wanted to build my own life around scuba diving. Uh, and I did my studies and I built my career in a way that I could accomplish that objective. Uh, and uh, I feel very honored to be part of this industry. Uh, and to have the possibility of contributing um, to such an amazing sector of the sports, travel, leisure, commercial, professional industry um, of the scuba diving world. Because scuba diving is not just one industry. I mean, depending on the way you look at it, it can be leisure, it can be a sport, it can be a profession for someone uh, but it's definitely complex and very, very interesting. Right on. So um, you went through the traditional routes, it looks like, and you studied at the University of Edinburgh? Yes, um, I studied. Um, so you know, initially, I'm very fascinated by scientific subjects, and I was very undecided when I had to choose which study journey to start. Uh, initially, I wanted to study... Uh, biology or medicine, uh, but then I decided to focus more on uh, economics, finance, and management, uh, and, uh, and that's the path that I chose. So I initially studied um, uh, economics at the University of uh, Lugano in Switzerland, uh, and then I did an MBA at the University of Edinburgh. Wow, so all over the place, and that's just amazing as well. So you're a passionate tech and cave diver. What challenges have you faced in these areas and how do you overcome them? And how does your, you feel like your degrees and education has helped you with that? Uh, so it, it was a long journey. I've been a pure recreational diver for a long time. Uh, basically since when I started uh, until when I was 23, uh, and my, my main passion was, um, I mean, exploring the underwater world uh, without going too much into, into technical diving. Um, but then the more you get into it, and also <laughs> thanks to my, to my job that exposes me to all of the possible kinds of, of scuba diving that you can do, um, I decided to start uh, the, the, the technical diving training, uh, and I, um, I first became um, a technical trimix diver, uh, and then I got passionate about it, so I also wanted to, to start cave diving. Um, and then it's like, again, it, it, it's, another, it's another journey that started for me, because then I also got very passionate about archaeology. Uh, my mother is, is an archaeologist, and uh, when I was a kid, she used to tell me amazing stories about um, the Roman remains that she used to find when she was an archaeologist. 
And I thought, okay, uh, I want to do that underwater. So I joined a number of um, archaeological um, diving teams uh, in Italy. Uh, and, um, and I started to dive with these amazing people um, that do incredible projects um, to discover, document underwater ancient wrecks. Uh, but also modern wrecks, for example, uh, World War II or World War I um, wrecks. And I must say, I mean, to get there, you need to go through um, a lot of training. So technical diving is something that, you know, when you, after a number of dives, it's, it feels maybe easy. <laughs> uh, it depends on the dive. Um, but what's important to say is that it it takes a lot of hours of pain <laughs> before you you actually feel comfortable at certain depths or or doing uh, complex tasks underwater um, and uh, and it was another amazing journey uh, that lasted the time it needed to last so mm -hmm. uh, I never wanted to rush into going deep or you know, doing complex stuff underwater, and uh, it took me a good three to four years um, to gain the competencies I wanted to gain before I could feel comfortable uh, in, in going to a certain depth or, um, or exploring caves. Uh, but it was really rewarding because the things that you get to see uh, during archaeological projects or uh, cave survey projects are amazing. Nice. Now you're definitely in a position of leadership, and uh, in my opinion, it's certainly a, a CEO mermaid um, because you're hard. To, you're done some amazing things, and there's not a tremendous amount of women at your level um, in the diving community. So, what are you doing um, to help introduce more women into the diving industry? Um, okay, that's a nice question. Uh, you know, for for a good amount of time, I've been. Uh, um, I was not really seeing a difference between men and women uh, when it comes to diving, because I think that if you have the willingness to do something, it's not your um, it's not being a male or a female that that makes a difference. But then. I, I realize that that's not always the case because there are some physical differences or different possibilities to access certain um, areas or environments. And, uh, and I got more and more passionate about this subject and I wanted to speak to women divers or potential uh, women divers to tell them that, hey, you don't have to be afraid. Yeah, it's true. I mean, most uh, the diving industry is, is somehow dominated by men because we all know that uh, around 70% of, of scuba divers are men. Um, mm -hmm. But that should never discourage um, women to, to start this, uh, this amazing activity. And... Uh, and to do so, uh, some years ago, I started to uh, I started some nice collaborations, for example, with schools, uh, where myself and a network of scuba diving instructors uh, went to speak to the kids to give lessons about the beauty of the underwater world and uh, the importance of um, of starting um, a safe journey to become scuba divers or free divers or snorkelers to enjoy the beauty of the underwater world. And that was an extreme uh, success. I mean, you know, talking to kids of between 11 and 17 years old and, and seeing their reactions when, uh, when we were telling them about the beauty of the, of the blue planet was amazing and a good number of them uh, decided to start uh, with a Discover Scuba Diving program uh, and, uh, and then eventually became 
uh, scuba divers, and now I'm still in touch with uh, um, with many girls uh, that became dive masters or instructors and moved abroad. Uh, and I think that's one of the most rewarding things that I've done. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and then I've been um, invited to a number of, uh, of, of, of conferences or events um, to talk about um, scuba diving and I mean, about being a, a, a woman in the scuba diving um, sector and what it implies and what are the difficulties. Um, and many interesting topics came, uh, came, came out of those events and, and conferences. And I do whatever I can to encourage um, women, especially young women, to become part of, uh, of this amazing world. Nice. So as, as the uh, vice, uh, executive vice president of Dan Europe, what do you feel Dan's doing to really address the, um, the standards with women, um, specifically their unique physical abilities and uh, um, uh, sizes without compromising standards? Mm -hmm. So um, as you very well know, Dan is a medical organization. So we, um, we are not a training agency. What we... Uh, we have very good relationships with practically all of the training agencies. We are part of the um, RSCC and of the other organizations that set the standards of, of, of the scuba diving uh, activities. Um, but we try to contribute from a medical point of view. We do a lot of researches um, to try and collect real data about uh, the diving activities. Uh, and uh, since a good number of years, we've been collecting a tremendous amount of, of data in, on our database. We have now over uh, 140,000 uh, real dives that we've collected and registered, including physiological parameters of the divers that did those dives. And 30% uh, um, of these um, is of female divers. So we were actually, we are actually able to trace if there are any substantial differences between men and women when diving, if women are subject to um, specific difficulties or if there are specific parameters that they should be more careful about. Um, and we've issued a number of articles, um, public scientific publications, uh, about this subject uh, and we receive a lot of questions from our members um, on, uh, on subjects like can I die when I have my period or can I die uh, if I just discovered to be pregnant or you know all the things that a woman would like to know before diving uh, and we are there to assist with our medical team um, to answer these questions and to keep investigating uh, specific aspects. Absolutely. So let's get into a little bit of that. Have you noticed any differences in things like DCS um, or gas density uh, results in women versus men? Um, I would say not major differences. Uh, however, um, especially on um, recent studies that we are uh, carrying on, on deep diving, it, there are some signs that women are slightly more uh, subject to DCI or to, to better say it, to producing bubbles in stressful conditions that include, for example, uh, underwater currents or cold water uh, and we, I mean, according to the data we are collecting, we actually can see more bubble production in women compared to men in the sample of divers that we, um, that we took during those specific studies. 
Um, now, of course, this is not enough to say that women are more subject to uh, DCI compared to men, but studies are ongoing and, uh, and results sometimes are, are quite interesting. Uh, we know, for example, that um, women have a different predisposition to um, feeling cold compared to men. Um, and we know that feeling cold is one of the factors that um, can trigger um, bubble production. So sometimes it's it's really about the, the physiological differences that you can find in the body of a woman compared to the body of a man uh, that can produce certain um, differences also in in the bubble production and, and the consequences that the bubble can have. Interesting. Interesting. So you, in terms of women tend to feel cold more, I know when my wife and I dive and we, my wife and I dive a lot, she always gets cold faster than, than I do. And I always wondered if it was because possibly she was smaller than I am. I mean, I'm, I'm 220, my wife is 140. And so I've, you know, I've got, uh, you know, 80 pounds on her. And if the ability to produce more blood, circulation through the cardiovascular system caused me to be able to be warmer or just because I'm overweight? (laughs) 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 There we go into a more complex subject that is the BMI (laughs) and that that adds more viability to it. But um, uh, yes, I mean, when when we organize a research field, um, we basically do two things. Uh, We collect data on one hand with a number of tools like the uh, echocardiography, Doppler uh, analysis, impedanceometry and uh, uh, urine tests and so on. Uh, And then we also ask the divers to fill in um, a module that is more subjective because we ask the diver to tell us, did you feel cold? Did you feel stressed? Did you feel um, fatigue, fatigue? Um, And that's very subjective, and it's a fact that for the same dive, uh, women usually feel colder uh, than than men. Uh, And probably they're also less afraid to say that they (laughs) felt cold during the dive or that they um, were tired after the dive. So uh, we also have to take into account uh, that the questions are subjective. To have now, I got to bring up something really interesting. So one of the things that, you know, so lay people out here that uh, we read these studies and I read dance studies all the time. I, we've even started a study on or started a short series on tales from Dan of interesting stories of um, divers doing dumb things. But you guys do a lot of studies that with interesting information. How does that start? So we, we say we're going to study these divers and we're going to measure them. What does that look like and what are you using to measure the the, uh, the size of the bubbles in the bloodstream and, and whatnot? Um, okay, so in, in Europe, so at the Europe, um, around 30 years ago, we launched uh, a project that we call um, Diver Safety Laboratory. Uh, that was one of the first projects of citizen science in the diving um, mm-hmm. industry. So it means that we started going into the field and uh, collecting data of real dives, of voluntary divers that were willing to donate their dive profile and their physiological data to our research department. Uh, And that kind of goes in parallel to the more formal scientific studies that happen in uh, uh, hyperbaric centers or universities or research uh, laboratories that we also do. Um, But having field research studies with real dives and and, and real divers added a lot of information to the general equation. And um, uh, to answer your question about how do you choose what to study, well, that depends a lot on on the uh, physiologists and medical doctors that work in our team. Uh, But we also try to answer to the most common questions that we receive from our members because they do have specific interests. 
Uh, at the moment, for example, most people want to know about deep stops or what is the best gradient factor to use during a dive. Um, and there is no perfect reply and studies are ongoing. So um, that's a main driver for our studies at the moment. Uh, and we need to collect a huge number of dives to be able to say something concrete about um, gradient factors or the importance of, of deep stops and at what depth should be the first deep stop. So these are important questions that need um, that need numbers. Uh, and, so, uh, and numbers. so we go out on the dive, um, and you're you're there. How? Um, I mean, there's there's word that they're starting to use real time data during the dive to be able to gather information. But is uh, talk to me about um, the the actual instrumentation. How do you measure mm -hmm. the, this process? What does that actually look like? Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, we try to use small instruments that we can easily take with us when we go to a field research study that could be on the, uh, on a beach or um, on a lake or on a boat. And uh, we, for years we've used mainly um, the uh, precordial Doppler that is a very small tool that uh, records the acoustic signal of bubbles. Uh, and then you need to, so we have a number of technicians that are trained to record a good signal. And then you have another team of people that would listen to the recordings and uh, detect the number of bubbles. So it's, it's all acoustic. Um, so in that case, it's really the bubble count of the bubbles that you can hear. Um, then we also, when, whenever we can, we also do um, visual bubble count. And you can do that um, with uh, an echocardiographer. So you actually um, do a video of the heart of the diver before and after the dive, and you can visually see the bubbles um, in the blood flow. And that's a visual count. Uh, there are also projects ongoing to develop softwares that can do the count without the need of a human being. So that, you know, if you upload the, the, um, uh, the acoustic recording, or if you upload the videos from the echocardiographer, um, the software can do the count itself. But that's that's still uh, um, that's still ongoing. Um, and then we have other tools. So th these tools that I've mentioned are mainly for the bubble count. Uh, and then depending on the study, we have uh, other tools that we use. For example, the bioimpedanceometry. We do that to um, understand the level of hydration of the diver during the uh, after the dive, before and after the dive. Uh, and there are a number of tools that we can use to do that. Um, you know, technologies evolves fast, so we have tools that are smaller and smaller uh, that are easy to, to to take with us when we go on the field. Um, sometimes we do blood tests to understand a number of things that go from the hydration of the diver to uh, the, the, the production of uh, specific um, uh, elements uh, from, from, from the body to understand the level of inflammation uh, and, and other parameters. So it's not... Uh, it's not a small <laughs> number of tools that we use. It really depends a lot on the study that we uh, that we are performing. But the the essential parts are the Doppler or the uh, echocardiography for the bubble count. So, what's your biggest takeaway that you've learned about bubble formation through all this? <laughs> um, so, I think that's quite widespread at the moment. Um, 
that bubbles, I mean, if you produce bubbles, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to suffer from the CI. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, you know, a good amount of um, what we call the bubble makers that produce a big amount of bubbles after a dive and have no symptoms at all. So um, the individual predisposition of the body um, really makes the difference. And for the same person, you could have different reactions in different days, depending on how the person felt that day, depending on um, other factors that might influence that particular diving day. Um, so the best reply to your question would be that there's a very high level of subjectivity to DCI. And uh, we need to keep studying because we still don't have a pill against DCI uh, or a drug of any kind. And, uh, uh, and uh, you might do everything perfectly and still end up in uh, having uh, symptoms. Uh, or you could do mistakes and uh, do, you know, uh, a more aggressive decompression profile or a more aggressive ascent and still have no symptoms. So it, it's very subjective. <laughs> it's interesting. So it seems like the more we study it, the less we know or the more we need to know to understand it. So definitely it sounds like an exciting science, that's for sure, to be involved with the understand DCS and how that occurs um, overall. So what are some things that uh, you um, that Dan is putting out now that's uh, changing? How do we avoid DCS? What are some key factors that you've learned that are like, do this and you're going to reduce your your order of magnitude of, re of getting DCS? Mm -hmm. Well, at the moment, uh, all of our data show that conservative profiles do statistically end up in, in having less symptoms or less uh, DCI cases. And when I say conservative, I'm, I'm talking about profiles that say in terms of, um, of gradient factors uh, that say below 80% of uh, gradient factor high. Uh, and well, then it, it also depends a lot on, on, on the dive. Like if we're talking about a recreational dive uh, in, in a you know, decompression range or about more complex dives with, uh, with, with long uh, decompression exposure. Um, but adopting a conservative um, approach to um, to decompression is definitely something that we can um, surely say reduces risks. Uh, and, uh, and at the moment, one of the most interesting um, things we are studying at, uh, at the Europe with our research team um, is the relationship between uh, heart rate variability and bubble production. And we are doing so um, thanks to some innovative um, tools that we've developed. Uh, we are partnering with a company that produces intelligent textile uh, in the form of a top that you can wear underwater and that records your vital parameters. So um, HRV, breath rate, uh, and uh, it sends these parameters to, um, to our research platform. And we then compare this data with uh, the bubble recording that we do uh, before and after the dive. And um, together with a team of mathematicians, we are um, trying to build a model to, um, to relate uh, heart rate variability to bubble production. And uh, this is all very new and the studies are ongoing, uh, but we are having some interesting results that will be the subject of our next uh, 
publications. Nice. That that gets pretty exciting. And so, um, so you're starting to measure um, heart rate and, and effect. So Henry's Law basically is what you're really looking at um, overall and how bubble is the, the gas is uh, uh, absorbing into a liquid based upon agitation. So um, what's the initial findings? Are you finding that with a higher agitation, higher levels of DCS or with a lower agitation of DCS? Um, well, you know, uh, I'm sorry, but... Uh, I don't want to go into a field that is not too much of my confidence. So. <laughs> no worries. That's certainly super um, interesting. Yes, that's super interesting. And, uh, you know, um, the less interesting part of it is that in my role of uh, executive vice president and, and, and CEO, and, uh, you know, like I've told you at the beginning, I've studied economics and uh, and finance and so on. So I'm unfortunately much more involved in the management of the company <laughs> than, um, than uh, how much I'm involved in uh, you know, um, doing the actual research. So my main objective is to make sure that we, that Dan Europe has the funds to uh, finance the research that we are doing because we are still a private entity. And even though we, we do receive a number of grants from, uh, from the European Commission every year to, uh, to perform our studies, uh, we still need the support of our members. So my, in, in, in my specific role, my main objective is that the company, the, the, the foundation and the companies that the foundation um, uh, owns stay in good health and uh, and most importantly, that we keep playing an important role in uh, in this industry um, because the best thing is that divers count on us. They have expectations. They know that we that that, that that's our mission. And uh, whatever we do at Dan. Um, we do it with one objective in mind, and the objective is we want to make diving safer and more accessible. And, uh, and to do research, well, you need money. So whatever we uh, gain you know, through our insurance products and through the services that we sell, we invest it in research. And, and that's what I'm really proud of. Nice. So how do you envision the future of diving safety, uh, considering the advancements in the research being conducted in the field? Um, well, research needs uh, competent people, uh, and it needs, in our case, we keep needing uh, the involvement of, of divers. So citizen science is an extremely important tool for us. I mean, being able to monitor and to collect data from, from real dives is of extreme importance. So the collaboration of uh, our members and of the diving community in general that supports our studies is, is of utmost importance. Um, and I would also say that collaboration between the various institutions, so universities, um, research laboratories, private entities like DAM, um, is also of extreme importance. So one of our goals is also to, um, to always be open to collaboration because yes, it's true, um, Working for the safety of scuba diving is our mission, and uh, we invest a lot of efforts um, in keeping, um, I mean, doing researches and, 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 and writing publications. Uh, but collaborating with, uh, with, with other specialized research centers and, like I said, universities and, and uh, uh, sometimes um, governmental institutions like uh, military research centers is also very important. And I'm saying that because um, I've seen, you know, many times 
kind of competitions between entities and uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's you know sometimes it it. It, it happens uh, in, in the diving field that you have, uh, I don't know, training agencies competing with each other, and that's normal because those are commercial institutions. But um, what I'm trying to say is that collaboration is also very important and sharing results and, uh, and sharing achievements uh, is very important to us. And we, we will always be very open to that. Absolutely. So you've mentioned citizen scientists a few times. Um, how do we uh, out here as divers, uh, dive professionals, di uh, recreational divers, technical divers, how do we get involved as a, as a citizen scientist to help Dan? Uh, okay. So we, um, whenever we organize field research activities, we invite our members to join, and uh, and uh, it's it's of course totally. Um, totally free to join. Um, sometimes we are invited by, for example, dive, dive clubs or dive associations that uh, organize diving days with their associates and invite us to go there and collect data. Um, and we are also about to launch a um, portal that is called uh, DANA, so then assistance. Uh, that will allow divers to upload their dive profile on the on the portal on an anonymous basis and answer some questions that we can match with the dive profile uh, and, uh, and and that will also be of uh, of extreme importance because even if we don't have all the physiological parameters that we can combine with the dive um, still having the possibility of um, recording and analyzing the dive profile and matching it with uh, the answers that the divers give us is very important. So for example, questions on the questionnaire would be uh, relating to how you felt during the dive, uh, how you felt after the dive, uh, if you had any symptoms, and if yes, there will be also the possibility to declare the symptoms, uh, and, um, and, and that will be very, very helpful. Right on. So that sounds very exciting. So uh, Dana, uh, when is this launch? It's going to be launched in July, July this year. That is exciting. Um, so Dana.org? It will be, Europe, I mean, you know, working in Europe, we also have very strict rules on, on, on privacy and data management. So that will initially be uh, open to, to, to our membership base that is European, that of course divers from all over the world will be able to upload their data, uh, but we will initially launch it in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Right on. So from your vantage point, what is the greatest change needed to reduce diving accidents? Hmm. Very good question. Uh, I would say learning, learning, um, experience, and not being afraid to declare or to say when something is, is when something is wrong. I know that might seem obvious, and uh, we keep talking about it, but we keep assisting divers that had symptoms and call us only when symptoms become serious, um, only when they are alone because they don't want other people to hear them. So denial keeps being an important, um, an important issue. Uh, and I can understand it because sometimes peer pressure is there and you want to be the one that ruins, you know, the, the trip to, to other people or you just, you know, think, ah, oh, it's okay, it's just a small pain. But being more honest about eventual symptoms and not being afraid of uh, calling for help, um, we, we need to keep reminding divers that, that that's important because early recognition of symptoms and early treatment um, is important. So 
More education, less denial. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That sounds like a good plan. I like it. I like I it a lot. I mean, conservative. I mean, um, uh, using conservative algorithms on your life computers. That's also never, uh, I mean, that, that, that's always good. <laughs> that's always put you on the safe side. I agree uh, completely. So uh, how do you balance from your point of view or how should the diver balance his, their need for risk management mitigation with inherent the dangers of the sport? Um, again, you know, it, it depends if you're talking about experienced divers or people that uh, are learning to dive. Um, I think, you know, what I've been noticing with uh with pleasure is that also diving training agencies are more and more um aware and uh attentive to the need of talking about risk management risk mitigation um whilst maybe in the uh late 80s early 90s it was more diving is fun it's just fun now also starting from open water courses, um, you learn a lot about um, potential risks uh, and and, uh, and uh, eventually risk mitigation. So I don't know if you agree with me, but I'm, I'm noticing this, this trend also when it comes to scuba diving learning. Um, and then again, it's, it, there are a lot of tools available, uh, so divers should read, should keep themselves updated with, uh, with the new trends, should uh, learn about also new tools that can help them to avoid problems. Um, well, when I did my first open water course, I, I didn't learn how to deploy uh, an SMB, for example. Um, now that's part of most open water courses. That, that's what I'm saying. So you know, overall, I, I tend to be a very, a very optimistic and positive person. So overall, I'm seeing a positive trend when it comes, also when it comes to um, to, to learning how to scuba dive, uh, and then uh, the responsibility stays with the divers themselves. I mean, uh, we all know that we are going into an environment that was not designed for human beings. So we have to do that prudently. Uh, and, uh, and diving can be dangerous, even though you probably know better than me that statistically speaking, um, it's less dangerous than other sports. But uh, we have to be aware that we are going into an environment that for the nature of things is hostile to humans so we have to be we have to be ready and um, especially when you travel abroad you travel to places that are difficult to reach via boat or helicopter or air ambulance uh, i mean your mind always has to be turned on and you have to think about what if what if something happens and it's it, during the night and there's no hospital working in the small island in this beautiful paradise where I am, but you know, something happens and there, there are no rescue, easily accessible rescue uh, facilities. So uh, yes, having a good insurance can definitely be of help, but sometimes you, you also need to be um, prepared to what could happen. So. Um, having a what if mentality is is definitely uh, helpful because diving is not just a sport; it's it's an activity that can potentially be risky. And pretending that it's it's safe and accidents can happen very rarely might not be the right choice. So overall, I, I think we're judged more often on how we overcome challenges or problems or failures. So, and, and we all fail at some point. Can you tell me a, a time that Dan really failed, but they came, they stepped up and said, wait a minute, we, we, we messed up here. We failed in this and, and this is how we fixed it. What did you do? What did that look like? Hmm. 
Um, so, you know, um, if you talk about cases when we fail to assist properly a member, for example, is, is this what you are asking me? Sure. Um, it, it can happen. I mean, um, if we talk about figures, we assist uh, on average 5,000 divers every year, um, and that's a lot. And, uh, and you know, I, I could tell you whatever, but in, at the end of the day, what counts are uh, independent reviews. And uh, if you have a look at um, Google reviews, Facebook reviews, Instagram, uh, Trendpilot, and so on, uh, we are above um, 4.5 on, on, on when five is the maximum. So that means that overall we do <laughs> a good job uh, and we are very proud of it. Uh, there are instances where something can go wrong. Uh, and many times it's about um, managing emergencies in remote locations. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've learned is that we cannot rely on uh, um, one single um, provider of, for example, emergency services, uh, transportation, like um, um, helicopters or air ambulances. So we need to have a very, very wide uh, network of, of providers because there can be instances where divers really dive in, in places that you will probably don't even know that they exist. So, um, and uh, and there is this somehow um, I wouldn't say wrong, but you know sometimes divers think, okay, I can go wherever, but if I'm with Dan, they would be able to rescue me in any case. Um, and that's true probably in ninety percent of the cases, but sometimes things happen in in in, in very hostile environments and. Uh, and it's difficult and it takes time. Um, we don't receive a lot of complaints. Um, we statistically we receive um, two complaints per year, and oh, that's wow. very, 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 very small. <laughs> we have to we have to have a register of complaints that we receive um, because we have um, in Europe we have our own. Um, um, insurance company, so that, that's very formal, that's very regulated, and we need to keep a register of all the complaints that we receive. And statistically, we receive very, very, very little, uh, and that's a public number that can be checked. Um, and uh, um, and sometimes they are about what I've just so told. So um, people that expect to receive an air ambulance in two hours when it can take up to eight hours. Um, and some other times it's about um, us not being, not accepting um, an insurance claim because maybe it falls outside of the conditions of the insurance policy. So these are the two most frequent cases of, of complaints. Um, uh, but yes, again, to answer your question, um, what we've learned is that having a reliable network of providers is essential because we do have to cover the world and mm -hmm. divers dive wherever <laughs> and we have to be always ready. So that's what we've been um, doing and what we keep doing. So how can I, as a diver, um, be more efficient at working with Dan? So for example, I go to one of these remote locations. I'm I'm diving some remote island and I have a, an incident. Mm -hmm. How can okay. I be more efficient in, in the preparation to work with Dan to be able to solve that medical issue? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, we, we do receive a good number of emails from our members that know that they are going to very remote locations. Um, also, for example, project divers that 
organize projects or expeditions. So I'm not, I'm not just talking about recreational scuba diving, but also you know, divers that actually do uh, complex projects in remote locations. And they write to us to um, ask for useful information about that location. So for example, if there's an hyperbaric chamber close by, uh, if there's an accident, what would happen? Um, that want to know more about how to contact us in case of an emergency, even though the procedures are published on our website. So uh, those are quite straightforward, but we are always available to answer questions from our members to guide them in case they know that they're going to very complex destinations or very remote. And I'm not talking about, I don't know, the Caribbean, Maldives, you know, places that are like, you know, uh, around the corner for us, meaning that we manage so many cases in those locations that it's really easy. But I'm talking um, of places like Sudan, for example, or um, very remote islands in Indonesia or Malaysia. Um, so places where uh, the level of civilization is, is, is definitely not the one of you know other other countries uh, and where it's really difficult to find hospitals for the, the, the even you know the, the primary emergency care and uh, and you need to evacuate the person to um, to the closest country so definitely we um, it's good to mention that we are open to assist our divers or to guide them uh, if they know that they're going to, uh, like I said before, if they know that they're going to places where it might be difficult to rescue them, um, they can let us know in advance and, and we can help them to even, you know, build the emergency, um, the emergency procedures. Uh, we cannot solve all of the problems. Uh, so another good advice is also to, um, to, to, to gather some basic information about what, which is the dive center where, I, where I'm going. I mean, do they have uh, an emergency oxygen unit? Do they have, uh, are they prepared to assist in case of an emergency? So that's also important, gathering as much information as possible regarding the destination where the diver is traveling to. We have a very useful guide that is called the Traveling Diver that is accessible on our website. Uh, Dan in, in the US also uh, have the same guidelines. And that's a booklet um, plent with plenty of information about like advice and uh, um, and, and, and information on uh, uh, how to well manage a diving trip, including uh, what to, what you should have, like what are the essential uh, drugs or or you know pieces of rescue equipment that it's good to have in your luggage. Um, that's very helpful. Right on. So. You've got a really interesting position here. You uh, in and being an executive vice president of Dan, in working with a lot of different agencies. And the agencies, while I, it's been my experience, they try and work nicely with each other. They also can be a bit headbutting. So you're and sometimes act a bit childish uh, in how they they work and see things because they see things from a different perspective. How do you balance being the Switzerland, if you will, uh, the, the neutral por portion between? And I'll just throw out the names. I know I was saying that they're good or bad. Patty, SD, ITI, SSI, all these. How do you balance that um, that relationship in, in a way that everybody plays well in the sandbox? Oh, well, <laughs> being the Switzerland, it's, it's nice. Um, we are neutral, that's true. So we never deny collaboration. We are always available. Um, uh, yeah, I mean that's that, that's it. Um, we are always available for partnerships. We are available for research projects, initiatives. We've collaborated with pretty much all of the all of the agencies, at least in in Europe. Um, we've done research events and activities 
during SSI events, TDI events. Uh, with PEDI, we have a very nice collaboration ongoing um, also on uh, ocean literacy and, and, and other specific um, projects. Um, but that's our condition number one. Whenever we start any kind of project or collaboration with, uh, with an agency, we always remark that we are neutral and we cannot give any exclusivity uh, because whatever we do has to be for the benefit of, uh, of the end user that are the scuba divers. So be it a research initiative or a commercial partnership, um, that's, that's, that's what we always have to, uh, to underline, um, that Dan is, is a neutral, uh, entity and, uh, um, and we never had issues in that, in that regard, I must say. Nice. So finally, one last question, looking ahead, what do you hope to accomplish in your role at Dan Europe and in the broader diving community? Um, my, I'm very, very much linked to the main mission of our foundation that is making diving safer. And, uh, my main objective is to keep innovating in the field of scuba diving medical research. I think that we are in a very, we are living in a very, very interesting time, uh, also considering the technological innovations that surround us like uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the continuous technological developments, we need to use them in the scuba diving research field too. So my main objective at Dan Europe is to keep innovating and bringing new technologies to the scuba diving research and medicine fields because that's very important. So we've always been innovating in a way uh, when we started with the citizen science, when we started uh, with some specific research projects. Now we also have to consider the power that new technologies can, can have. Um, so we are investing, uh, um, we are investing also on this. We are investing on uh, understanding how these new technologies can impact our um, fields of activity. And I think that's, that can be very interesting and, and, and very important to, to bring our researches to, to another level. Um, and, uh, and then as a second objective, I would say, um, that is always part of my intimately part of, of, of me is to keep talking about how beautiful the underwater world is and, uh, trying to bring new people, trying to bring young people to loving scuba diving because again we are living in in a time that i mean where young people do care a lot about the environment and uh, so i think it's the right time to to spread the message that we need new ambassadors of the blue planet we need to find new ocean lovers that can help us spread the message and how important it is to, to protect uh, waters that form more than 70% of our, of the planet Earth. So sure. I would say that these are my two top objectives. Right on. Laura, thank you so much. Anything else you want to share about Dan Europe? Oh, I think I spoke even too much. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Very interesting. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you, Laura, for coming you. on today. Again, my name is Benjamin Hadfield. We'll teach me to dive. Make sure to subscribe to their channel. If you like this kind of content um, and hearing from amazing 
people like Laura. Laura is absolutely just a fantastic wealth of knowledge and we're blessed and, and honored to have you on here. Again, thank you so much, Laura, I appreciate you. Thank you, thanks a lot. It was very nice talking to you.